Shalom, Mizro, Shalom, Shalom, Brother Nakwa, Watchman for Israel, coming back at you with these precepts. Add another cold cut, giving, of course, our honor and our glory to Yahweh. By Shuma Mashiach, Kumalaki Abushai. A double honor to the elect elders of the house of David that's been in this truth for decades and decades, patiently waiting for the second coming of Hamashiach, Kumalaki Abushai. A hearty, mighty Shalom to all of the mighty men of the Most High God who are out there on the highways and byways, pushing this truth, magnifying the ministry. Salaki so presenting their body as a living sacrifice and enduring all things for the elect sake. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to all of the men that may not be out there on the highways and byways as of yet, but they're working on it. They're getting built up, built up in the spirit. They're praying, they're fasting, they're studying, they're being diligent and abounding in the work of the Lord. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to all of the aqua out there, the sincere sisters out there, holding it down in the households, reverend to their husbands, being submissive being diligent and moving in the spirit of our righteous foremothers. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to everybody tuning in live, dying Israel, from Egypt to Israel, divinely fashioned, Anthony Knox, Juan Fig Figura, right, Salaki, if I'm butchering the name, Antonio Brayboy, Nehum Yasha'ala. Shalom, shalom to everybody who's tuning in and that will tune in, Lord willing. Shabbat shalom. This is biblical history and early morning prophecy and the ancient world. Biblical history, early morning prophecy, and the ancient world. So we're going to dive back into the ancient days. Let's go to the book. We're going to dive back into, let's see if this I can pull this up. All right, dive back into the time of our forefathers, man. All right, let's go to Psalms chapter 77 and verse 5. All right, we're going to dive back into the time of our forefathers and even dive back into the time of the ancient world, man. Right, this Psalm chapter 77 and 5, right? I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. So we want to be able to go back into history and see particular events that the Most High has set up, how they relate directly into us, what it has in store for these other nations in terms of judgment, what the Heavenly Father has done. Because again, we're not taught these things growing up in this man's world. In this man's world, you're only taught well, I'll say this. You only taught modern history about the so-called white man as presidents and uh, American history and the government's foundation and the Constitution and all of that. And any ancient history you, you do know, it has nothing to do with you. Huh? You're learning about all types of madness and folly, but you're never learning about our own history. Huh? And not only that, the deeper thing is the history in the, is in the Bible. In the Bible, you can read about the Assyrian Empire. You can read about the Babylonian, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. You can read about the men of Tyre and Zidon, right? Chiefly the ancient Israelites, man. You can read about all these different nations. So the Bible says, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. See that? My spirit made diligent search. So you want to make diligent search concerning the ancient world. Now, there are key chapters that deal with, um, and I want to go into prophecy too, right? So I want to go into ancient wor world, and I want to go into prophecy. Let's go to Daniel, the eighth chapter. All right, we're going to go into Daniel, the eighth chapter. We may jump, jump around. Now, this is a, a biblical timeline right here. Right, here's a timeline of biblical history. From the time of uh, Tower of Babel, where you have Abraham, it's a little bit blurry, but you can see it. 2165 BC, circa, right? And when you say circa, it means not exactly that year, but it could be around that year, right? Most scholars, most men of the Lord will agree that Abraham did walk the earth around the time of 2170 to 21 you know, 65 BC or so. Within that area, he, he began to be born and walk the earth, right? Most scholars would agree that the Exodus began around 1446 BC, right? Or 1445 BC. So this is a timeline right here, man. A lot of these dates, they add directly up with um, real world history. Again, you can go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cornell, Dartmouth, Brown, any Ivy League school. Bring this timeline up with these dates and these emperors, and uh, they'll say that this thing is true, huh? 
Hey, like we always say, we can go in the Bible and read about Cleopatra. We can go in the Bible and read about uh, Caesar Augustus. We can go in the Bible and read about Julius Caesar, Claudius, Nebuchadnezzar II, Merodach Baladon, right? We can read about the uh, Adasite Empire, Sargon, right? We can read about all these ancient men, you know? Now, when you read Daniel, the eighth chapter, right? This says, vision of the ram and goat. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan in the palace, which is by the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. Now, Shushan the palace was a chief capital of the Persian Empire. Now, the Persian Empire had, if I'm not mistaken, four capitals. See this? Shushan or Susa, the winter residence of the Persian kings, located on the river Ulai or Coas Coaspis, right? So they had a winter residence. They had a summer uh, residence at all of these places that they were dwelling. Now, if we look up a Persian empire on the map, let's see. They should, if there's, if there's an accurate map, they should show us their four major capital cities. So let's see if we can pull this up in a, um, all right, it's kind of blurry. Let's see if we can get another one. All right, bear with me. Let's see. Um, I may have to find another map. If that one doesn't work out, I'll just get another one. Or I may just type it in. Here's a map of the Persian Empire. Let's just go into this Persian Empire capital cities. Right? See this? Achaemenid Empire. You see that word Achaemenid Empire? That's just another name for the Persian Empire. Now their capital is Parasopolis, Babylon, Susa, Pasagardai, or uh, Ectabon. These are their major cities that they had. Like America, you got LA, you got DC, all right, you got New York. You know, those are the chief cities of Babylon the Great. So where Daniel was at, he was in one of the capital cities of the Persian Empire, uh, Susa or Shushan the palace. You can read about that same place where Esther was at, man. You know? So Esther, Daniel, they all knew about Shushan, uh, Shushan the palace. Now here it is on the map right here by the river you lie. So when you're looking up and reading these books, these chapters and verses in the Bible, you have to go into it. You can't just read it as if it doesn't pertain to you, man. The Bible is your book. And it and it goes into the relationship and the, the timeline of history and our forefathers, where they dwell at in each point of history. Remember, America is not our first captivity. We were in captivities under, under every nation under the sun. When you go to Deuteronomy, right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's go to the curse. Deuteronomy 28 and 25. It reads, Salakia, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And we were removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Every nation had us in captivity. Read the book of Judges, even small nations. Had us in captivity, man. Huh? When you go to First Maccabees, let's go to First Maccabees, chapter two and ten. Right, First Maccabees, chapter two, and verse ten. What nation hath not had part in her kingdom and gotten the first spoils? So you name a nation that didn't let that did not oppress Israel or rob us or put us in captivity. Name what? 
you may say, well, what about the Vietnamese? What about, or they're Moabites. Remember, you have geopolitical nations where boundaries set up by men, like the Vietnamese. People separate the North Vietnamese from the South Vietnamese or the North Koreans from the South Koreans. And they separate the, the Japanese from this people. And the, guess what? Those are Moabites and Ammonites. So regardless of their geopolitical boundaries, they're all one nation. And the Moabites had us in captivity, man. Because people want to get simple. When did the people of Switzerland put the Israel? Well, those are Edomites. There are 18 nations in the Bible. So when it says what nation, it's not talking about France or it's not talking about uh, Tasmania or the Congo. It's speaking about the biblical nations. Let's pull up um table of nations. Right. Lucky, bear with me. I'm gonna see if I can get this. If I type in Hebrew Israelites, it should come up in the images. It's been the best way I've been able to find it. All right, here we have it right here. So here's the 18 nations that the Most is talking about. You have Israel or Yasha Allah. You have the so-called white man Adawam in the Hebrew, <laughs> which is uh, Edom. India, the so-called now the India could be uh, the East Indians, Pakistanians people of Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, those are all your um, Elamites. All right, it's not just people in India, it's those, because they people move. What man, they migrate, and they, they create other countries with their own boundaries and laws, but ethnically, they still belong to a common ancestor. So if you're in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and you're an Elamite, man, more than likely. That's Ayalam in the Hebrew. You have the Assyrians, Ashawar. Now, the Assyrians, they dwell in modern, what they call the so-called Middle East. Now, we pull up a map. Where's this map at? So here's Assyria right here. I want to get a better map. I saw a good one. Bear with me. So we're going into geography, timelines. Prophecy. Let's see if we get this map right here. All right, this is this is fairly decent. Okay, hold on. See, they want you to actually go to the site. All right, which I don't want to do, but um, let me see if I can get this. See if they'll have a zoom in. All right, so here's your Persian Empire. All right, now your Assyrians would be right here. If you see the word Assyria, again, it's kind of blurry, but you can look it up on your own. This region around Turkey, right? The region around uh, uh, Iran or Jordan or Yemen surround this region right here. So those are your Assyrians. All right, so when you go back on this map, you have the Assyrians, that's Aram. You have your Arabs, your, uh, uh, your Ishmaelites, right? Yashmaya Allah your so-called Chinese or your Moabites, and that could be your, your North Koreans, your South Koreans, the Chinese, the Taiwanese. They're all Moabites. You got your Japanese, your, uh, your Ammonites, your Ethiopians, right, which is Kawash or Kush, Egyptians, Martizarium, right, or Mizraim, like you. Um, North Africans, Pawat, those are your uh, Algerians, uh, ancient Moroccans, yes, uh, Libyans, right? Those are your uh, so-called Northern Africans. Their foot or Pawat, they're going into captivity too. Your South Africans, Kanaim, your know, Canaan, Turkey, Gamar, Russia, Makawak, Greek, Yawan or Javan, German, Ashkenaz, Spanish, uh, Tarshish. Or Tharashiash and Cyprus, Kathayim, or Kittim. So in 1 Maccabees chapter 2, it says, What nation hath not had part in her kingdom and hath gotten of her spoils? It's speaking about those 18 nations. That's what it's talking about, man. Huh? So when you go back to this, let's go back to this um, map. 
right, of the Persian Empire. We're going into the time period of Daniel being in captivity under a particular empire called the Persians. Now, the Persians were ruled Salakia, by Elamites and also uh, 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 Ishmaelites, right? Now, let's go to this. Elamites and Ishmaelites. Let's go back to the book of Daniel. So Daniel dwelt in Shusha, the palace. So again, you want to put this in its proper perspective. You want to read this, the Bible. You want to look up these places. These are your forefathers. You want to see where they dwelt at, where this captivity was, how long that empire lasts. You don't want to read this like a Christian. The Christians have no scholarship. They don't go into history. They, they don't go into prophecy. They take everything off of face value, right? We can't be like that, man. I'm going to read Daniel 8 and 2 again. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. Now, I want to go into Shushan real quick, not too long. Just so brothers can um, get some understanding on that. Right, so the palace of Shusha or Shusha, and this is where Daniel was. Let's see. Um, on the outskirts of the city Shush in western Iran. So Daniel was in Iran, man. He wasn't in LA, right? He wasn't in the Hamptons, DC. He wasn't on a double-decker tour bus, but he was in Iran. So our forefathers, again, we, we're from the other side of the world. We have a, we're supposed to have an ancient Near East uh, Hebraic Semitic mind and culture and language. We're so Americanized, we're bugged out, man. You know? Now, Daniel was there because of captivity, but and guess what? We're still from that side of the world. So on the outskirts of the city Shush and the in western Iran lie the remains of Shushan, winter palace of the kings of Persia, and the setting of the Bible book of Esther. All right, so I wanted to actually go into the history. Let's see. Um, okay, let, let's deal with this. Okay, Susa was one of the most important cities of the ancient Near East. Where I'm reading right here. In historical literature, Susa appears in the very earliest Sumerian records. For example, it is described as one of the places obedient to Ainana, patron deity of Yeruk, and Makar, and lord of Aratan. And you can see it's right around where the Elamites dwelt at. So Daniel was surrounded by the Elamites. Where a lot of Elam was out there. All right. Susa is also mentioned in the Kivitun, right? I mean, uh, uh, um, I need to go into the, the writings, right? The writings or the prophets. So you get the word to knock from. All right. It's an acronym. By the name of Shusha, mainly in the book of Esther. Nehemiah was also there. And Daniel. According to these texts, Nehemiah also lived in Susa during the Babylonian captivity of the 6th century BC. You see that? So Daniel was there, Nehemiah, Esther, a lot of our forefathers were taken to this chief city of Susa. And you had a palace there where the king dwelt at. Huh? So let's go back to this in Daniel 8 chapter which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and that was by the river Ulai, Daniel 8 and 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and a higher came up last. So we actually saw this ram with two horns, right? Let's pull this up, ram with two horns. All right, ram with two two horns. Now, the ram with two horns is symbolic 
for the Medo-Persian Empire, right? The ram is symbolic for the Medo-Persian Empire. Why? Because one side was the Medes and one side was the Persians. The Medes and the Persians had a joint empire, had a joint empire also known as the Medo-Persian Empire, right? Medo-Persian Empire. And we got to go into this history, man. Everything's not going to be about Esau bowing down and kissing the boot or getting on a so-called black woman or Deuteronomy 28 and 68 and John 316. The, the scriptures are manifold. They cover a wide variety of knowledge, history, prophecy, breakdowns, uh, uh, how to love your brother, charity, how to serve the most high law, statutes, commandments. It's very, very, very very diverse, man. So somebody asked, are the Medes and the Persians the same? Right? No, they're not the same. Right? There are two. Let's go into this. I want to find a legitimate as much as we can, right? All right, let's go into this. Right? J, sad to say, but JW.org. Let's see if they go into it. Right, we're not going to deal with JW.org. All right. So when you read about the Persian Empire, the Persian Empire actually became an empire because they took down the Medes. The Medians ruled before the Persians. Right? The Medians were responsible for actually taking down the uh, Assyrian Empire. So when the Assyrians ruled the earth and they fell, you had two main empires that took them out. You had the Medes and you also had the Babylonians. All right. Now, the Medes became that sole power in process of time. Let's see if I can spell this word right. Sire Axes. Okay, let's go into him. All right, bear with me. Okay, so Sire Axis, he was one of the kings of the Medes. He's one of the kings of the Medes. He reigned from around 653 to 585 BC. Remember, you had the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel 8 spoke about a ram with two horns. One horn is the Median Empire. Another horn is the Persian Empire. We often talk about the Persian Empire, but right now we're going to take, you know, a few seconds or so and go into the Median Empire. All right. We're going to go into the Median Empire. And the Median Empire lasted before the Persians. They reigned from 678 to 549 BC. And that's a good date. And look how vast their empire was. Right. Look how vast it was from Bactria or Bactria, all the way down to Cappadocia in Asia Minor. So the Medes was a big deal, man. They were a big deal. They were At one time, they were the top power in the known world. But they don't get a lot of recognition, you know, and a lot of praise because the Persians actually took, took over them, man. you know. And their empire wasn't as long as the Persian Empire. That is 678, the... Um, 549 BC. Now think about it. Any timeline that we're going into, we want to see where we were as a people between this time. What were the Israelites doing between 678 and 549 BC? Right? Now let's pull up a timeline. Right? Where's this biblical timeline? See if we can get that. 678 to 539 BC. It's the timeline. Right, Salakia. So that's around the time of Isaiah when the Medes was in power. Right, the Assyrians in 722 BC, they began to take the northern kingdom captive around that time. And they put them in the cities of the Medes. You had 605 BC when uh, Daniel was taken into captivity. So you had a lot going on around that time. That was uh, around that time when the Medes ruling 
it was heavy affliction upon the Most High's chosen people. Right, the Northern Kingdom was already taken captive during that time, and you also had the um, certain Israelites that were taken captive of the Southern Kingdom during the reign of the Medes, because the Medes ruled, but also at the same time the Assyrians were ruling too. All right. But the Medes actually took down the Assyrian Empire. And we're going to go into that, right? I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I want to jump down. Right now, let's see. Um, yeah, let me jump down. Now, the word Medes goes back to the word Madai. Madai goes back to um, Japheth. Right when you go back to Genesis the 10th chapter, so I want to go into them taking down the Assyrians. Okay, here we have it Neo Assyrian dominance over the Medians came to an end during the reign of the Median king Cyaxes, who, in alliance with King Nebuchadnezzar of the Neo Babylonian Empire attacked and destroyed the strife-riven Neo-Assyrian Empire between 616 and 609 BC. The newfound alliance helped the Medes to capture Nineveh and 612 BC, which resulted in the eventual collapse of the Neo-Assyrian Empire by 609 BC. See that? So the, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, sire axes of the Medes, took down the Assyrian Empire. The Medes were subsequently able to establish their Median kingdom with Ectabon as their royal capital. Now you can read about Ectabon in the book of Tobit, right? Let me see if I can pull up Ectabon. Let's go to Tobit real quick. Or I believe that's Tobit, the third chapter. Yep, Tobit chapter 3 and verse 7. And it came to pass the day that in Ectaban, a city of Media, Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, was also reproached by her father's maids. So that's where Tobias got his wife from. Tobias got his wife from Ectaban. Because Israelites were carried captive all the way out into Ectaban. Now let's pull up that map again. Here's Ectaban. Right, right under the word Persian. So they were taking, that's a long, that's a long slave journey. From the northern kingdom of Israel, let's just say Samaria, miles and miles and miles all the way to Ectabon. So we were scattered, man, all over the earth. You know? So Raphael and Tobias had to travel to Ectabon to get their wife get the wife of uh tobias right again i wanted um let's see there's another yeah i'll just be content with that map let's see what we got with this one okay that's okay all right, so we have that um that ancient map. And Ectabon was their chief city. So let's go back into this. The Medes were subsequently able to establish their Median kingdom with Ect Ectbatana, Slaki, Ectbatana as their royal capital. So again, the Medes are one of those horns. The Medes came into power by taking down the Assyrians. All right? That's ancient history. We always talk about the Assyrian Empire. When we talk about these different kings, we talk about uh, Sargon, Selamanesar the fifth, Tiglath Pilesar the third, right? All of these Assyrian kings, they were all taken down by the Medes. Ashurbaalit the third and all these Assyrian kings. They were taken up around 612 to 609 BC by the Medes. So the Medes actually came into power, first and foremost. 
And the Babylonians were in power, but the Babylonians had more of a stronghold. But then the Medes and the Persians ended up joining forces. So I want to go back to the Medes and the Persians, because again, in Daniel 8 chapter, it reads again, Then I looked at my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. So the two horns are the Medes and the Persians. And the two horns were high because it was an exalted kingdom. But one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. So what horn came up over the other horn? Well, the Persians took over the Medes, right? So yeah, the Medians took down the Assyrians, but in process of time, the Persians took down the Median Empire. We're going to read that. Sire Axes was succeeded by his son, King Astyages, right? And 553 BC, his maternal grandson, Cyrus the Great, the king of Anas, it's like Anshan or Persia, a Median vassal revolted against Astyages. So the Persians actually came into power by being a small little city state, for lack of better terms, or province, and they revolted against the Medes. Because again, if you look up the Median Empire, you see a place down here called Persis. Even though it says Persian Empire, let's pull up a Median Empire. Hold on, let's pull this up. Right? The Median Empire. Pull this up on the map. And again, you'll see Persis. See, this is a good map. This is nice and clear right here. So Persis right here on the bottom of the screen is where Cyrus the Great came from. They weren't really a big power at that time. They were just a small province, you know? But eventually they came into power and they started taking down places little by little. And then they came into Ekteban or Ekbatana and defeated Astyages and took over the entire Median Empire. So that's what that means in Daniel chapter 8, there were two horns. Originally, it was Persis and Media. But Persis or the Persians took over the Medes around 550 BC. Right? Let's go to Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter. Right? Ecclesiastes. And that's what Daniel saw in his vision. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And I want to start at verse. Eight, right? Because of unrighteous dealings, injuries, and riches got by deceit, the kingdom is translated from one people to another, right? Because kingdoms, they don't just utterly be broken down. When they get defeated, they get absorbed into the kingdom that overthrew them. So when that happens, the, the women become that other nation's woman. They'll kill off the men. They may take some of the men into slavery, but in the ancient world, hey, guess what, man? You killed the men, the warrior class, the ruling class. In the ancient world, you might have uh, uh, made them eunuchs, man. You might have castrated them so they don't pop, deal with your woman. Because you don't want that nation to impregnate the woman of your nation and make more of that nation. So a lot of times in the ancient world, this is just how it was, man. Right? They would castrate men if they didn't kill them. They'll cut their rod off, their stones, so they wouldn't impregnate none of those people and make more of that nation. Or if they didn't do that, they'll just outright kill them. And they'll kill the boys if they don't take them captive. Or they might make some of those guys join their army. Right? They might work out a deal and say, hey, look, we won't kill you, but you're going to be forced to, to fight on the front line of our army. You know? And they'll take the women and they'll enslave the women and lay down with those women and make more of their nation through that woman. And all of the gold, all of the silver, they're not going to destroy that. All of that gets absorbed into the other nations. That's what this means when it says the kingdom is translated. Boundaries are translated. Wealth is translated. And people and merchandise are all translated, meaning from move from one kingdom to the other. So when the Persians took down the, uh, the Medes, it's the exact same boundaries. If you look up the boundaries, they expanded a little bit. 
Look at the empire of the Medes. And there's is there any huge difference between the Median Empire and the Persian Empire? All right here it is again. Here's the Medes. It's, it's a little bit, but not it's not too much. The Medes and the Persians. They're just about the same thing. So they didn't destroy the boundaries. That's not what happens when you take nations captive, right? You make a new uh, nation through you, through your people. And guess who else told us to do that? The most high. That's ancient warfare. But remember, we're, we can't be um, Americanized Israelites. Oh, that's harsh. Why would they take the woman and, and lay down with the woman? Why would they kill the men? Remember, we're, this is the ancient world. This is not a, a 2023, man. This is a, a sissified, effeminate, emotional society that you dwell in, man. Things were different. And they stoned people in the ancient world. They'll burn you, impale you, hang you. And a lot of men couldn't last in the ancient world, man. If you took a time machine and went back to the time of Moses, you, you better, look, you'll be walking on eggshells, man. They'll stone you. Write this um, Numbers chapter 31 to show you that um, this kingdom being translated. Numbers chapter 31 and verse 13, 14. I'm going to get straight to the point. So the Israelites went to war against the Medes. I mean, it's like an Median Empire. Let me correct that. The Israelites went to war against the Median Empire, and they came back with a whole bunch of captives. So Moses got mad at him, man. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said to them, have ye saved all the women alive? He said, why would you save all these women alive? Why would you take these women captive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Baalim to commit trespass against the Lord and the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord because these women was seducing uh, uh, Israelite men to serve their gods and eat up their uh, sacrifices. So here's the law, right? Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. So what does this mean, kill every male among the little ones? Kill the little boys, maybe 16 and under. Line them up and just kill them. Oh, God wouldn't do that. God loves everybody. This was a mistake. Well, well sh charge the Most High with a mistake if you want to, man. Remember, the Most High is a man of war. This is how things were in the ancient world. This is going to happen in, uh, when we take these nations down, man. Whatever man don't get taken captive, he's going to get killed. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones. And kill every woman that hath known man by lying with them. Why? Because these women were defiled. So any woman that laid down with a man, those women got killed too. But all the women children, meaning the young woman, the virgin woman, that have not known a man by lying with them, keep alive for yourselves. So they would take these women captive and they would lay down with these women, Israelites, and make more Israelites through that woman. And that, and that wealth and those people got translated to the Israelites. Same thing with the Medes and the Persians. Same thing with the Assyrians and the Medes. Same thing with the Persians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Persians and the Romans and the Greeks, man. It's just warfare, right? It's nothing to get emotional about it. It's just ancient warfare. That's how things are, you know? Now, when you go back to... Let's pull this up again. Salak so either. See where I was at. Okay, the Medes. So in 553 BC, his maternal grandson, Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, a Median vassal, so they were just a province, revolted against Astyages 
In 550 BC, Cyrus finally won a decisive victory, resulting in Astyage's capture by his own dissatisfied nobles who promptly turned him over to the triumphant Cyrus. After Cyrus' victory against Astyages, the Medes were subjugated to their close kin, the Persians. In the new empire, they retained a prominent position in honor and war. They stood next to the Persians. Their court ceremony was adopted by the new sovereigns who in the summer months resided in Ecbatana. And many noble Medes were employed as officials, satraps, and generals. See that? So the Persians and the Medes had a joint empire and the Medes had a lot of influence, but the Persians called the shots, right? The Persians called the shots. And um, they defeated them, if I'm not mistaken, at the Battle of Ectabine. And there's a famous artwork of Astyages, who was actually the, um, um, the grandfather of Cyrus the Great. A lot of brothers don't know that Astyages was the grandfather of Cyrus the Great. All right, Astyages was the last king of the Median Empire, the son of Sire Axes. He was dethroned in 550 by his grandson, Cyrus the Great. All right. Astyages succeeded his father in 585 BC, following the Battle of Hales, which ended a five-year war between the Lydians and the Medes. He inherited a large empire, ruled in alliance with his two brothers-in-law, Croesus of Lydia and Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. You see that? So ask the, th this, is th this was a tight-knit deal going on, man. Astyages had two brothers-in-law. His two brothers-in-law was King Croesus. And if you if you read Daniel the seventh chapter, you know about King Croesus, one of the ribs in the mouth of the bear. And Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was also a brother-in-law of Astyages. You see that? So when Cyrus came into power, Cyrus, and we're, we're going to go into that. Cyrus actually took down these different men. He took down Nebuchadnezzar. He took down King Croesus, right? And his son took down the uh, king of Egypt. So let me read this again. He inherited a large empire, ruled in alliance with his two brothers-in-law, Croesus of Lydia and Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whose wife, Amethyst, Astyaga's sister was the queen for whom Nebuchadnezzar was said to have built the hanging daughters of Babylon. Right? However, due to recent evidence, the garden was likely built by Sennacherib. Married to Aranus, the sister of King Croesus of Lydia, to seal the treaty between the two empires, Astyages ascended to the Median throne upon his father's death later that year. So a lot of these guys knew each other. Nebuchadnezzar, King Croesus, Cyrus, Astyages, they all lived in that same area. They were top men. Like now, Vladimir Putin, he knows about Joe Biden. Joe Biden, he knows about Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un knows about the leader of China. They know about, they, they know each other, man. And then the ancient world, they would actually do marriages amongst each other to seal up that relationship between the two kingdoms, right? That was a political move. So this is what this is going into in Daniel 8 chapter, the two horns that are high, but the higher that came up first, man. Let's go read more about that in Daniel 7 chapter, right? Let's go to Daniel, the seventh chapter. So the Lord said, be not ignorant in anything in a great matter or a small. This is Daniel chapter seven and verse five. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs and the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said, thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. You see that? So this is speaking about the exact same thing in Daniel 8 chapter. 
See that raised up itself on one side is the same thing as one horn was higher than the other and the higher came up last. So this is speaking about the Medo-Persian Empire. The bear is the Medo-Persian Empire and it raised up itself on one side because the Persians took down the Medes. Now it reads, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it. Now the three ribs represent the three empires that the Persians took down. Again, the three ribs, see a rib is a carcass of, a, of an animal. If you see a dog in an alley and he got like a dog bone in his mouth or a cat and he ate that animal, man. Or a cat, man. He got blood all on him and he got bones. And, and guess what? He just got through devouring another creature. So the Persians devoured three other smaller beasts. The first beast that they devoured was King Croesus of the in the Lydian Empire. They fell in 545 BC by Cyrus the Great. This is the first rib that was overthrown. Croesus was the king, and he reigned from 585 to 546 BC, was the king of Lydia, who reigned from 585 until his defeat by the Persian king Cyrus the Great in 547 or 546 BC. According to Herodotus, that's a Greek scholar, he reigned for 14 years. All right. So he was known for his high wealth and a, a, a lavish lifestyle, but he got defeated by Cyrus of Persia. And he's one of those top men. Hold on, let me go back. See if I can pull up the Lydian Empire. All right, bear with me. Lydian Salakia. All right, so here's the Lydian Empire on the map. Long reigning empire. So the Lydian Empire was taken down by Cyrus the Great. And if you want to get deeper into it, there's a city called Sardis. When you read Revelation, let's go to Revelation. You read about these seven churches. All right, let's go to Revelation the second chapter. Wait, that's what I want. Maybe the third chapter. Okay, Consulaki, believe that's three and four. Are three and four. Revelation three and four. Thou has a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So Sardis was a city that a lot of Israel during this time. A lot of Israelites dwelt there. You had a church there. Sardis is a city in modern-day Turkey, formerly known as Asia Minor. All right? Sardis, a luxurious city in Asia Minor, the capital of Lydia. All right? So when Daniel, um, the seventh chapter, says that there were three ribs in the mouth of it, one of those ribs are the Lydians. And King Croesus. King Croesus in the Lydian Empire was defeated in Sardis. There was a chief battle called the Siege of Sardis, in which the um the Lydians were defeated by the Persians. Let's pull that up. All right. Siege of Sardis. So for, for brothers that, that that go deep into it that go deep into the prophecy, you want to get more into the history, that's what we're going into right now. We're going into early morning history and prophecy. All right, so we're not going to talk about the so-called black woman and her weave. We're not going to talk about sports or football. We're not going to talk about the who won the Grammys, and we're not going to break down John 3.16. All right, we're going to dive into other um, levels of understanding that are documented in the Holy Bible. Right now, do you need the notice for salvation? No, right? But is this necessary for you men and for the servants of the Lord that really teach you the highways and byways? You got to know, you got to be in tune with these prophecies, man. You brothers that are uh, um, that teach, you brothers that are studious, that study, 
You got to know these things, man. You know, this is um Siege of Sardis. The Siege of Sardis in 547 to 546 BC was the last decisive conflict after the Battle of Thymbra, which was fought between the forces of Croesus of Lydia and Cyrus the Great. When Cyrus followed Croesus to a city, laid siege to it for 14 days, and captured it. You see that? So you had something called the Siege of Sardis that followed the Battle of Thymbra. All right? So you had the Battle of Thymbra, where the Lydian Empire was taken down. Then they fled to Sardis. So when they fled to Sardis, they thought they can get some rest. But Cyrus followed them to Sardis and defeated them. That's how one of the ribs became to be in the mouth of the bear at the Battle of Thymbra and the Siege of Sardis. All right, so again, in Daniel, let's go back to this. Daniel 7 chapter. All right, since we're going into biblical history, timelines, and prophecy. Daniel chapter 7 and 5. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, thus, unto it arise, devour much flesh. So again, the three ribs are what? One rib is the Lydian Empire, and King Croesus defeated at the Battle of Thymbra or the Siege of Sardis. Another rib that goes into it are the Babylonians. Right? Cyrus the Great defeated the Babylonians at the Battle of Opus. The Battle of Opus was the last major military engagement between the Achaemenid Persian Empire and the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which took place in September 539 BC during the Persian invasion of Mesopotamia. At the time, Babylonia was the last major power in Western Asia that was not yet under Persian control. See, that's so you had the Battle of Thymbra to take down the Lydian and the Battle of Opus. And they have movies on this, man, documentaries. For brothers that really want to get into it and see the battle formation and how they defeated them and the flanks of the army. See, I, I like war, man. Huh? I love war. I love ancient war, battle formations. A hey, uh, brothers love to play chess, right? Brothers love military strategy, right? These are the things that that uh, uh that generals think about, man. Huh? The Most High is a man of war. He created all of these battles and all of these wars, man. Huh? So you you know you might want to get into it, man. Get into these um these battles on YouTube and ancient history and websites and YouTube channels like um. Kings and Generals, Invictus. There's another one, um, Epimetheus. There's a lot of channels on YouTube set up by the Mosad that covers this history. Right, let me go to the classic, Ecclesiasticus 5. Right, we bring this out all the time. Ecclesiasticus, the fifth chapter. Right, now first and foremost, you want to focus on building yourself up and it's truth repenting, keeping the commandments, getting built up in the spirit. But again, you know, when you get deeper into it, you'll dive into these things. It's Rec 5 and 15. Be not ignorant of anything in a great matter or a small. So, you know, you don't want to be caught out there. Right? You don't want to be caught out there being deprived of knowledge. Now, let's go back to, okay, the battle of Opus. And again, I'm not going to go to the video. So lucky and watch the video. You can look it up on your own. Now in this battle, it was it really wasn't even a, a deep battle because he pretty much walked into the city and the city submitted to him. Right? They actually submitted to him. Let's see. Um, 
All right, bear with me. I'm not going to read this whole battle. Right? I'm not going to read the whole thing. Okay, it reads, the outcome of the battle was clearly a Babylonian defeat, possibly a rout. A rout in battle is when you get put to flight, you just kill everybody. As the defeated Babylonian army is not mentioned again in the chronicle. Following the battle, the Persian forces took plunder from the defeated Babylonians. Most translations of the chronicle also refer to a massacre of the people of Akkad. Right? Though translators disagree on which side was responsible and who was killed, the population of Apis or the retreating Babylonian army. Right? So, nevertheless, the Babylonians defeated the Per, I mean, um, were defeated by the Persians. That's the second red in the mouth of the bear at the Battle of Apis. The third red in the mouth of the bear are the Egyptians. The Egyptians were the third rib in his prophecy. They were defeated by the Persians at the Battle of Pelusium. Let's go on to that. Battle of, lead us the Battle of Pelusium. See, it says cats right there. We'll talk about why it says cats. Okay, the Battle of Pelusium was the first major battle between the Achaemenid Empire and Egypt. This decisive battle transferred the throne of the pharaohs to Cambyses II of Persia, marking the beginning of the Achaemenid 27th dynasty of Egypt. It was fought near Pelusium, an important city of the eastern extremes of Egypt's now Delta. 30 kilometers to the southeast of modern Port uh, Said and 525 BC. The battle was preceded and followed by sieges of Gaza and Memphis. So the siege of Gaza and Memphis were in tune with the Battle of Pelusium. You see that? Now, this is also known as the Battle of the Cats. Why is it called? And I believe you can even look that up. If you look up um, Persians, Battle of Cats. Let's see what comes up. See that? Battle Pelusium. A victory decided by cats. Why? Because the, the foolish Egyptians, being the great idolaters that they are, worship cats and dogs. They had things like Anubis and Sphinx, and they worship the beast of the field and the fowls of the earth. They reverence cats. Cats were like God to them. So what did Cambyses II do? He took a whole bunch of cats and led them in the battle, man. And it made the um, the Egyptians flee. And he put the uh, the shield to their soldiers. He put cats on them. So they wouldn't fight the cat that was on their shield because they thought that that was their God. So, you know, they, this was a, um, a big deal, man. So the ancient Egyptians had a great reverence for life in all its forms. Life had been given by the gods, and reverence for it extended beyond human beings to all living things. Although the Egyptians did occasionally eat meat, and their royalty certainly engaged in a hunt, the Egyptian diet was primarily vegetarian or pescatarian, and this reflected the undertaking of the sacred nature of all existence. Even when animals were eaten, thanks were given for the sacrifice, pets were well care, cared for, and wildlife and nature was respected. Like this is sounds like America, right? This value is visible everywhere throughout their culture, from art to Egyptian religion, but is epitomized by the Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC. This engagement was the decisive clash between Pharaoh Satmik III and Persian King Cambyses II, resulting in the first Persian conquest of Egypt. See that? They brought cats out there, man. They painted cats all in their shields and led and was throwing cats at the Egyptians. And the Egyptians didn't want to fight, man. 
How, how maddening is that? Right? They didn't want to fight because they didn't want to kill their God. So they're, they're foolish. Right? Foolish Egyptians. Okay, let me jump down. The battle was a decisive Persian victory brought about by the Persians' clever use of cats. As cats were sacred to the Egyptians, the Persian army herded cats and other animals in front of their battle line and painted cats on their shields. The Egyptians, afraid to hurt sacred cats and incurring the wrath of Bastet, that's their so-called cat god, Bastet. They didn't want to get jammed up by Bastet, the cat god, were shaken and decisively defeated. All right? So this is the third rib in the mouth of the Persians. So Daniel saw these things, but he didn't know what these bears represented, right? Or, or what the, the, um, the lion in the mouth of it was. A lot of this stuff had to play out in the course of history, right? And play out in time. So for people that say, well, the Bible's not real. It's a book of about a whale swallowing a guy and, you know, a flood and a guy that walked on water. They don't know the Bible because history is in here, but it's codified. It's written in code. It's crypt crypto. I believe that's the word. It's, it's cryptified. No, no, that's not. Let's see. Um, no, I, I don't want crypto. I want um. When something is cryptic, it's hidden. Right. Let's see. Crypt. That might be it. I'm gonna have to find right find the exact definition like the word apocrypha when you look up the word apocrypha let's see if they got the online etymology and yeah, that may be shorter word or two right but with the word apocrypha let's go into this they might not have it oh crypt See that? Apocrypha, from the Latin apocrypha or scripta, or from the Greek apocryphos, meaning hidden, obscure, hard to understand. Now, let's say books of unknown authorship. Let's see, from apo, meaning off or away, or apo, and cryptine, to hide, or crypt. You see that? So crypt means to hide something all right to hide something that's really what it means a vault or a crypt so the bible is written in crypt right it's codified you're not going to be able to understand the battle of policing it's not going to say what you wanted to say in the bible it's not going to say okay the persians and the medes took down the, uh, the babylonians at the battle of opus in 539 BC. Then you turn the page. Okay, it says then the Persians took down the Egyptians and Pharaoh Satmuk III at the Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC. Then you turn the page. Okay, then a black man and Hispanic man, they're going to go into slavery on ships and be sold to the Caucasus. It's not written like that. Don't you know if the Bible was written like that? Hey, the so called white man would have been burned it, man, and got rid of it. It would have been too transparent. It's not meant for everybody to know, right? Let's go to the book of um, Matthew, right? Let's just go to Mark. Let's go to Mark, the fourth chapter. That's why people don't believe in the Bible because it's really not for everybody to understand, right? Mark chapter four and 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12, slot you, Asked him of the parable, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So certain brothers will read Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and they'll never get it. All right, Daniel 2, Revelation, especially these other nations. All right, these other nations, they open up the Bible and they, they don't know what's going on. They have no idea. They think it's an actual bear. Now, although Daniel did see a bear, it's a similitude. Although Daniel did see a he goat, 
And a ram, it's a similar to. It represents real life people, right? And uh, real life events. All right, so we can't get, you can't get simple in this thing. Well, oh my God, the Bible. Uh, I get scared because I read about a dragon, a red dragon with seven heads, and uh, then it had ten horns, and another beast came out of the sea, and it was likened to, and they're getting all tripped up. That's why people say, oh, Revelation, that's a scary book, right? Let me see, is Revelation a scary book? Look at this. People are looking this stuff up, huh? Why is Revelation scary? They said, isn't that scary? Why is it so strange? See that? They kind of answered it. See that? They kind of got this one right. Because of intricate and unusual symbolic language. That's why the Bible isn't for everybody. It's intricate and unusual symbolic language. The book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and um, the book of Second Ezra, those are probably some of the deepest books in the Bible. That's just my opinion. There are other deep books in the Bible. Uh, Zechariah is top, top five. Uh, Ezekiel is a deep book, but between Revelation or between Revelation, Daniel, Second Ezra, um, Ezekiel, Zechariah, those are probably your deepest books in the Bible. And just in terms of similitudes and visions, right? In terms of uh, prophecy. Now, I'm gonna read this again. Because of intricate and unusual symbolic language, the book of Revelation is hard for modern people to, uh, to read. They are not used to this kind of literature. I wonder who put this together, man. right? Sound like an Israelite. They are not used to this kind of literature. Not so for people in the ancient world who would have been more accustomed to the complex nature of apocalyptic literature. You can't get around that. Why? Because in the ancient world, we always use codes. Where are people are parables, allegories, dark sayings, even now slang. Jake, you use slang. Look, I'm going to be there in a minute. Soon as you tell that to the so-called white man, he says, hold on, hold on, let me get my timer out. And he gets his timer out on his phone. He says, hold on, hold on, Jeff. And he pressed 60 seconds. He said he'll be here in a minute. It's not, it's not literal. There's a lot of things Jake say that slang. You know? Jake say, hey, look, are you picking up what I'm putting down? I've heard, hey, look, are you picking it up? Are you following? It doesn't mean, it's not, a lot of stuff isn't literal. People say it's raining cats and dogs outside. So they're not used to that. Esau is so bland and so robotic in nature, everything's like carnal and literal to them and logical and straight to the point. We're a spiritual people, man. right? We are a spiritual people. Look at this, why is Revelation scary? So they don't know what's going on, right? They don't know what's going on. They have no idea what's going on. It's not scary when you got to understand it. You know, it's about our salvation. Right, and the destruction of these other nations, man. You know, so let's go back to this. Let me get one more about the dark sayings. Let's go to Ecclesiasticus chapter 39. Then I'm going to go back to Daniel as we uncover this history through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Right, Ecclesiasticus chapter 39 and verse 3. He will seek out the secrets of grave sentences and be conversant in dark parables. You see that? So a, a man of the Lord, when it's time, he'll get to the point where he'll be conversant in dark parables. He'll be able to go into the dark parables and grave sentences and uncover them. You got parables and you got dark parables. Dark parables are like a mystery, a riddle. All right. And a riddle isn't meant for everybody to get. It's a secret. So we we uncovered the three ribs. We, we uncovered this. Let's pull up this bear with three ribs in his mouth. All right, so we can get a visual. 
of what Daniel may have seen on a physical level. See if we can get a good one. Now, Daniel actually saw a bear, but remember, it was symbolic. See that? See that? This is the Medo Persian Empire. It's raised up on one side because the Persians took down the Medes in 553 to 550 BC. Cyrus the Great came into power. Then you have these three ribs. One is the Lydian Empire defeated at the Battle of Thymbra and the Siege of Sardis around 545 BC. The second rib is the um, Babylonian Empire defeated in 539 BC at the Battle of Apis. And the third rib are the Egyptians being defeated at the Battle of Pelissium, a.k.a. the Battle of Cats. In 525 BC, Pharaoh Satmuk III was defeated by uh, Cambyses II. Now, Cambyses II was the son of Cyrus, man. You know? So that's what this vision is that he saw. It's the exact same vision in Daniel 8 chapter. Let's go to back to Daniel 8 chapter. Right? Daniel chapter 8. And verse, I'm going to read three one more time. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and a higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So the Lord gives you their empire. They pushed west. They pushed north. They pushed south because they really already started in the east. They didn't push too far east. Again, look up the Persian Empire and see their kingdom. Right. Let's pull the picture up. Let's see, uh, open image. No, I don't want that. See, you can't even get a good map nowadays, man. Right? You can't even get a good map. Okay, this is this this is cool right here. See, we can zoom in on this one. All right, that's cool right there. You see that? So I'm gonna show this map. Now, here's a map legend down here. So all of this, what you see, just, you know, brothers may say, yeah, I know that, but this is for brothers that don't know. Uh, um, you see these Roman numerals. You'll see this, uh, these blue lines. This is just reading the map 101, right? This blue right here, this tan area on the outside, uh, this red line, these dotted lines going down. This right here with th these uh, thick slash lines going through, all of this with those colors and codes and lines represent are explained in a map legend, also known as a map key. So whenever you look at ancient maps, most of them have a legend to be able to show you what you're looking at on the map. So these white circles represent major population centers. So when you go back on this map, let's look for these white circles at Damascus. A lot of people dwelt there. Babylon. It just gives you more insight on what are people doing with that. Okay, so it only did Babylon and Damascus as far as I can see. And then you have other population centers, right? These are other cities that people dwelt in. Capital labels denoted with underline. So the capital places have an underline on the Ekbatana, Susa, Parsagadai, and Parasopolis. See, they have the underline right there that shows you that those are the four capital cities of the Persian Empire. The Roman numeral right here, which are divisions of the Achaemenid Empire, according to Herodotus. These are the different states, for lack of better terms. Right? For lack of better terms. Right? That's what those Roman numerals represent. And also, 
they, these thick slash lines are unruly territories with limited Persian authority. Like right here, they was kind of doing their own thing a little bit. Persians really couldn't control them. So they was doing their own thing, Pisidia. All right. And this line is the royal uh, road that they made for Darius. They can travel from Susa all the way down. All right. So that's what a map legend is. And according to the prophecy, it says that the Persian Empire pushed westward. All right. Let's see this and see how they push west. Where's this Persian Empire? Just had it. Zulakia. All right, let me put this over here. So they started right here in Persia, and they pushed west. So they started going and taking this side of the world down. All right, all of Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, and Egypt, and parts of Greece. They started taking over those areas. So that's what Daniel saw. And they pushed northward. So when you pull this map back up, north of Persis, they went into Parthia, Right, they went into uh, um, Sagdania, right, back back Tria, and other places, and they pushed north all the way up past the Caspian Sea and southward. So they went into Israel, they went into Egypt, so that no beast might stand before him. So they took down every kingdom, and no kingdom could really fight against the Persians. The only empire that took down the Persians was the Greeks. And they didn't really do that until around 200 plus years later. So they had a great long rulership of well over uh, 200 years. Well over 200 years of rulership that nobody could really take down the Persians. And I always like the reference, and that's one of my uh, favorite movies, man. That's a timeless movie. You can watch the movie 300 all the time. And again, in that movie 300, they kind of give you some insight of um, how vast and wealthy that Persian empire was. All right. And you can also read about that Persian empire since we're covering the book of Daniel. And we went into this on a Sabbath service for Purim, Daniel 11 and 1. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood up to confirm like you also I in the first year of Darius to me even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him and now will I show thee the truth behold there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia and the fourth shall be far richer than they all and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia you see that so you have three kings in Persia Cambyses the second you had Bardiya, then you had Darius the first. These are the three kings in Persia that helped expand this empire and made it become so vast. And then you had a fourth king who sealed the deal. So those are the three kings in Persia. And the fourth, which is Xerxes the Great, also known as Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. And the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Right? So he stirred up against the Greeks. But that's a topic, you know, for another day. So when you go back to this in Daniel, the, and we may go into that, Daniel the 8th chapter, no beast could stand before him. You had these four my, uh, major kings, man. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So the Persians ruled from 550 to around 331 BC. Let's see, Persian Empire fall. Okay, now they're saying 334. And some of these dates, sometimes they're maybe, you know, three, one to three years off. Right now, the Persian Empire began to decline under the reign of Darius' son Xerxes. See that Xerxes is that fourth king that we read about in Daniel the eleventh chapter, who was the richest of all of the other kings. Xerxes depleted 
the royal the royal treasury with an unsex, unsuccessful campaign to invade Greece and continued with irresponsible spending upon returning home. Persia was eventually conquered by Alexander the Great in 334 BC. See that's so he depleted their treasury, bankrupted the kingdom, wasted their soldiers, killed off their people. And again, they have videos and movies on that. If you want to watch and see how they actually fell, you know, uh, I encourage brothers to do so, man, right? and dive into this history. Now, again, during this timeline, what were the Israelites doing? Let's pull back, back up the timeline again. We're going to keep referencing it. During the timeline, you have people like Esther, Mordecai, Ezra, Nehemiah, Joshua, the high priest, right? Zechariah, Haggai, um, um, Ezekiel, or Ezekiel, you know, somewhat, um, Daniel, Habakkuk. A lot of these people, well, all of these people lived during that Persian Empire. They all lived in the Persian Empire. Right? Now, Ezekiel, you know, he was mainly, mainly Babylon, but Esther, again, Mordecai, Nehemiah, Ezra, even Malachi. Malachi lived the earth during the Persian Empire. See, Malachi, I'm going to say this. The prophets, when you read Isaiah, you read Jeremiah, you read um, Lamentations, you read Ezekiel, right? You read Daniel. The major prophets are in chronological order. The entire Bible is not in chronological order. Some of it is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. All of those are in order. Those are the straight from the beginning all the way down. Then you have books like Ezra and Nehemiah. Those are also in order. Right. And you have um, you have other books that filter in throughout that from the Apocrypha, like Tobit and Judith and things of that nature. But when you get to the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, those books are in order. When you go to the minor prophets, the minor prophets are what they call Hosea all the way to Malachi. So you got Hosea, you got Joel, you got all these. Let's pull it up so brothers can actually see what's going on. Right. Just to give you some understanding. So these books right here, I can't really zoom in, but if you're looking at it, right? Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These minor prophets, what they call the books of the 12, are also in chronological order. Hosea started during the Assyrian Empire, Malachi into the Persian Empire. So Malachi, Zechariah, and Haggai were all prophets around the time of the Persian Empire. The last book of the Old Testament is still in the middle of the Persian Empire. And when you read the book of Maccabees, it picks up where Malachi left off. You see that? So let's go back to this. Right, so nobody can stand before the Persian Empire, not one. Now I want to go into this real, real quick. The Persian Empire. Let's see. Um, you know what? We'll we'll hold that point and we'll touch on that later right we'll touch on that later i want to go into daniel 11 and 2 again right daniel 11 and 2 and now will i show thee the truth behold there shall stand up yet three kings in persia again those three kings are who campuses the second bardiah darius the first and xerxes and, and um slacky and um there's the first those are the three kings the fourth is xerxes and the fourth shall be far richer than they are. And by his strength through his riches, he shall stir up against the realm of Grecia. 
And these are your, we covered this on the Sabbath service earlier last week, but these are your Persian invasions of Greece. You had one Persian invasion. See, Persia wasn't content. Persia was like America. Persia wanted to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing to the point that they wanted to invade Greece. See, they already wanted to come out here into Greece. But the Lord didn't want them to conquer all of Greece. See, the thing about the Mosai is the Mosai has set up how long you can rule and how far your boundaries are going to be. So no matter what plan you have in your mind, you're not going to pass the boundaries of, of the Lord. There is a reason why America has from this uh, East Coast to this West Coast. There's a reason why they didn't push up and take over Canada or push down and take over South America. Because the most I wanted them in a specific place, man. See, this is outside of man's control. This is the handiwork of Yahweh by Shmiya So when they wanted to go into Greece, the most I shut it down. He said, look, you're not going into Greece, man. Job chapter 14 and 5. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. So what does this mean his days are determined? How long a rulership is going to be has been predetermined by the Lord. How long your life is going to be is predetermined by the Lord. If you're going to live 25 years or 2,500 years, guess what? That's set up by the Most High. How much wealth you have, your boundaries, how much land you acquire in life is set up by the Most High. The Lord has it down to the number of your months. Yeah, I'm going to let this guy live maybe uh, 746 months. And he has a timer, for lack of better terms. Also, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. So there are boundaries that you can't go past. There's a reason why certain brothers never left the country. They never left their state. There are guys that never left the block. There are guys who have only been to the corner store, to the church, and their grandma's house their whole life. They've never even been downtown. They've never even been to the other side of the block. They lived on the block, then they died on the block. They can't go past. The Lord has restricted the goings of men and opened up and unrestricted the, uh, the um, board, uh, boundaries and borders of men, even empires. So the Persian Empire being so vast, that was the will of the Lord. And them not being able to go into Greece, that was also the will of the Lord. So they wanted to go there and stir up the, all the realm of Grecia. Right now, again, you add your first and second. All right, first, uh, let me do Persia, Salakia. Invasion of Greece. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Right, like I said, they got movies on this. You can watch movies. They got documentaries. You know, they, they get into it. All right. The Battle of Marathon was part of the first Persian invasion of Greece. The battle was fought on the Marathon Plain of northeastern Attica and marked the first blows of the Greco-Persian Wars. See that? So they wanted to go into Greece. But the Lord wasn't having it. So he had them kind of duke it out. And guess who won? The Greeks ended up fighting against the Persians. Right, here's a good map right here. See, this, this is a good one right here. Greco-Persian Wars from 499 to 479 BC. Here's another map legend that we discussed. And the purple is the Persian Empire and the orange are your Greek states. This green line are the Persians stirring up the Greeks and fighting against them with the first invasion. The red line is the second invasion in 480 BC. So let's look at this. Let's look at the red line first. I mean, the green line. The green line was led by Darius the first. Darius the first led an expedition down into this part of Greece. Right now, let's look at the battle um, one. That's the battle of Marathon. So the Persians came all the way up here, and 
moved all the way up here into the plains of Marathon, where this number one is, and fought against Esau. Right? They fought against the Edomites, and guess what? The Edomites beat them. Because it was it was about that time for the Edomites to come into power. The most I put the spirit in them to actually defeat the greatest empire on the earth. That was that first invasion, that green line that you're looking at. That was a defeat by uh, of Darius the first, who got defeated by the Greeks. Now, you had a second invasion. That's where this red line comes in. The Persian campaign, that was led by Xerxes. And that's where the movie 300 comes in. Now, the Persians came in westward, like we read, northward. They had a, a home base in Sardis. And from Sardis, they went around to fight against the Greeks. And this is the Battle of Thermopylae. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't want to go too deep into the Battle of Thermopylae, but let me pull this up. The Battle of, I believe they call that the Hot Gates. Yep, and that's, yep, that's that Sparta movie, the 300. That's where the Spartans went up there. See that the Battle of Thermopylae was fought in 480 BC between Xerxes I and the Greek city-states led by Sparta. You see that? See that right there? Under Leonidas I. All right? Led by Leonidas I. So these are different battles that were going on during this time. This is... um. Good history to go into. The Bible covers, like I said, it covers everything from the time of the, of the creation all the way to the flood, to the Tower of Babel, to the journeys of our and the pilgrimage of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Joseph and Pharaoh, to the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire and the Medes and the Persians. See that? Lasting over the course of three days, it was one of the most prominent battles of both the second Persian invasion of Greece and the Greco-Persian Wars. All right, I'm not going to read this whole article, but, you know, you can look into it on your own. Right, so this is what this map is about. Here's an artwork. See, they all got to be naked for some reason. Right, but this is the battle between the Persians and the Greeks. The Battle of Marathon was the first battle, chief battle, and the Battle of Thermopylae was the second chief battle. So they fought at the Battle of Thermopylae and fought 480 BC, right? Then the Persians sacked Athens, then you had the Battle of Salamis and the Battle of Plataea, right? So that's what Daniel chapter 11 is talking about. These wars between the Greeks and the Persians, these battles, Marathon, Thermopylae, Palatine, so you had this Persian Empire, but eventually they started meeting their match, man. They fought against the so-called white man, Esau. And it was time for Esau to come into power. See, the Most High, he could put a nation in power or he could debase a nation. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Right, this is Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse, no, it's like this, Jeremiah 18, it's like you. This is Jeremiah chapter 18. And verse 7, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy. So at any instant, the Lord can start plucking a nation down or he can start pulling a nation up. Huh? That's what the Mosai does. So now the Persians are beginning to fade away and now the Greeks are coming into power. And that's where Daniel 8 comes in. Right. Let's go back to Daniel 8 chapter. Right, Daniel. So we're covering his history, man. And we're linking it in directly with the Holy Bible. Right? And um, I, I wanted to check out the comment. The brother put a good comment. I'm going to go back to this. But um, from Egypt to Israel, a great book for Israel to have is the Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. That's right, man. 
This is one of them right here, right? Now, you can get one of these. Now, believe it or not, I actually got this from a grocery store, right? It, it's a still, man. Huh? This was a still. I got this from Giant, I believe. $30, $30 right? Now, there's a, a series of books. If you get it online, right? Hey, but, but there's a lot of... um. What I found that a lot of places like grocery stores, uh, Walmarts, these, they will have books like this that nobody gets, man. Cheap. You know, they'll, they'll have things like, why is this? You know, they always got that little, little book. So I always try to get that little book section, and they always have like a religious section. So I always try to see, you know, what kind of Bible book I can get into, right? But this is um, the Rose Chronological Guide to the Bible. And there are different other rose books that you can get, but the rose books are beautiful. There's one on just strictly chronological studies and guides. There's another one on other timelines and history, the Old Testament, and it's it's, it's a beautiful book, man. They get uh, it's very good for brothers that are visual learners and visual readers. It has maps and pictures and captions and scriptures and. Uh, a great detail. The most I put the spirit in them to, to cover things, you know, in great detail with the scriptures so you can go and verify. And it's a it's a beautiful series of books. So if you get into that history, and I got a lot more. I'm not going to pull out all of them. Probably got some upstairs. All right, let me see if this one. All right, that one, that one's all right. That one's fairly decent. Right, so bear with me. Now, the brother who put that comment, he stirred me up to see what else I got. Oh, here's another one. Right, got to blow the dust off of this one. Now, this is, I almost forgot I had this. This was a gift for Purim. Uh, a brother got me this for Purim. Now, this is um, from Carl Ramusen. A Zondervan Atlas of the Bible. So, you know, we have the Zondervan, with my Bible dictionary, all right? You got the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. I, the, um, the Bible that I like to read, now I'm getting into it. That's okay, right? That's okay. Right? This is your Zondervan, another Zondervan uh, KJB study Bible. So you have your Zondervan Bible. You have your Zondervan Bible Dictionary, but you also have a Zondervan Atlas of the Bible. And this this is this book go is crazy with history, man. For you brothers that's in the history, if you don't have the, the, the Atlas of the Bible, well, what are you waiting on? I sound like a salesman, but hey, but for real, this this is a this is a good deal right here, man. It's a good deal. Right, this was a uh, uh, forty-three, forty-three dollars. So it's not, it's not too far fetched. Right. So um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, obviously, but it goes into everything. I mean, no stone is unturned. No, they go into Ezekiel. They go into, and like I said, I, I deal with the Zondervan heavy, man. There's a lot of publishing companies like uh, Nelson and Thomas and things like that, that that brothers deal with. But me, my personal reference, and um, I prefer the Zondervan publishing style and company due to the amount of detail that they put into their craft. So there's a lot of craft and maps and timelines that you want to get into. That's your atlas of the Bible. So you want to get your rows and you also want to get your atlases. Now, here's another Rose book. This one, Rose, is Bible charts, maps, and timelines. You see that? Bible charts, maps, and timelines, right? This isn't Zondervan, but Rose, Rose Publishing, they put a lot of craft into this as well. This is from Hendrickson. So if you have a Hendrickson Bible, they give you, they give you um, check this out, 100 archaeological proofs of the Bible. So that's for these guys that say, well, the Bible isn't real. Well, they have over a hundred archaeological studies and findings and proofs of the Bible. 
that show the, uh, the validity of the Bible through archaeological and historical studies. Right? They got the Hebrew in here. They got long maps and genealogies and timelines. So, you know, brothers, brothers can get into that too. What else we got? This is, my, this is one of my favorites. This one is beat up. It's beat up and bruised. But, you know, that's because brothers been putting in the work with it through the spirit. This is the historical atlas of the Bible, a, a fascinating history of the scriptures, a visual guide from ancient times to the New Testament. So this is a, another good deal. And maybe one day we'll just do a cold cut going into the, going into this, man. Just maybe picking out a few pages and going into that history and going into the timelines. Right, they got layouts of the city being rebuilt, so you can know how the city was rebuilt in the time of Nehemiah and during the time of our forefathers, man. So that's that's another good one. Let's see if I got maybe one or two more. All right, this is a this is a smaller one. This is um, I got this from a thrift store. Right, this is um, I don't have the cover of it. But it's called Sacred Places. Sacred Places. And it's really for geography, right? Sacred Places. And they go into, you know, different places in the scriptures and give you the, um, the studies behind it, the climate, topography, uh, geography. Uh, and they go into these different things, man. Right? So, you know, I'm glad that brother put that comment. It prompted me through the spirit. This is a complete guide to the Bible. I got this from another grocery store, right? This might have been um, at some grocery store, maybe Giant Walmart they got out here. This is a complete guide to the Bible. So they got uh, references, uh, details, artwork, and they kind of go into it as well. I don't have my favorite one down here. I got it, I got it um, upstairs, but my favorite... My favorite one is the Collins Atlas of the Bible. All right, let me see if I can pull that one up. Let's see. Um, then I'm going to go back into, into what I want to get into. Now, this is this is another still. If you don't get the Zondervan um, Atlas of the Bible, get the Collins Atlas of the Bible. It's not expensive at all. Right, the Collins Atlas of the Bible is also amazing craft, detail, and time spent into it. 1150. Jake, you'll buy four bags of hot Cheetos, man. And a pair of Jordans. You know, so you, you want to get into some of these. Uh, these are more so geography, history, timelines kind of deals, man. You know. It helps you understand particular uh, uh, empires and rulerships and dates and names. And, you know, that's if you, you take that time to go deep and to study those things, man. You know? So, nevertheless, I want to go back with the time I do have. So, um, and brothers, look into that stuff, man. You know, you brothers that get into this thing, you know, get into it, man. Get into it. Leave no stone unturned through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai. Now, let's go back to Daniel, where we left off, right? We had the quick, quick uh, interlude. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 4, one more time. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, and he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touch not the ground and the he goats like in the goat had a notable horn between his eyes so as daniel was watching this ram march and push west and north and south he also at the same time saw this he goat with a notable horn between his eyes <clears throat> let's look up this he goat right he goat notable horn Right, we'll type in Daniel to get the context, to get some understanding. See that? So Daniel saw this, man. 
you actually saw a he goat with a notable horn between his eyes. Now this he goat represents the Greek empire because the Greeks are gonna come into power and eventually take down the Persians, right? They're gonna come into power and eventually uh, take down the Persians. Let's pull that back up. And a notable horn between his eyes is who? None other than Alexander the Great, which I don't like to call him Alexander the Great, you know, we, Alexander the Creek, the Greek, the Freak, Alexander, the, whatever, you know, but he's there's nothing great about that man. But nevertheless, the so-called white man calls him the Greek. He has attributed to him, attributed to him with that title. He's the notable horn between the eyes of the um, this he goat. Let's read this in Daniel 11 chapter. Daniel chapter 11 and 3. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So this mighty king is Alexander. Alexander the Great was the top so-called white man at that time. He came out of the Macedonian Empire. The Macedonian Empire began to be prominent during the fall of the Persian Empire, right? So here's the Macedonian Empire. Let's pull this up. Macedonia, also called Macedon, was an ancient kingdom on the periphery of archaic and classical Greeks. I want to jump down to... Okay, we'll read this. I'll read this part. Before the fourth century, Macedonia was a small kingdom outside of the area dominated by the Greek, by the great city states Athens, Sparta, Thebes, and briefly subordinate to the Achaemenid Empire, right? Because the Persians were ruling over them. During the reign of the Argiate king Philip II, from 359 to 336, Macedonia subdued mainland Greece and Thracian it's like a Drissian kingdom through the conquest, it's like it through conquest and diplomacy. Now, Philip II came out of the Argiot dynasty and we've done breakdowns in the Argiot dynasty. The Argiot dynasty goes back to the house of Argos or Argos. Argos was one of the first places that Esau settled in when he started to take down the Japhites. And that's the cold cut for another day. Argos, when Esau revolted against our kings of Judah and he started, you know, um, taking over Europe, he will never, ever, ever tell you how he did that. Now, the so called white man has books on the, the ancient Ming dynasty, the Tang the the Tang dynasty. He can tell you how old the earth is. He'll tell you the earth is 4.6 billion years old. He'll do a carbon dating. He'll cover all of his history, but he will never, ever tell you. He'll find fossils and bones. And But why won't you tell us, Esau, how you got into Europe? You That's one, two things he never talks about, who, the, who God's chosen people are and how he got into Europe. He'll talk about everything else because he's no... The Esau, he's from the Middle East too, man. Esau's from where we're from. He's from that, that Semitic lifestyle. Padan, Aram, uh, Syria, you know, Mesopotamia, the fertile crust. That's where eat, that's what the home of the so-called white man. But now he wants to be a Caucasian. He wants, I'm from the Caucasus. He's not from the Caucasus Mountains. His original habitation. It's Mesopotamia. Then the Most High moved them to Mount Seir. And from Mount Seir, a lot of them went up into Europe. Then they got pushed into the Caucasus Mountains. You know? But there's a lot. We, we're going to have to cover the so-called white man and his lies, too, man. Why are we talking about this? Because we're talking about the Argiot dynasty. Philip II came out of the Argiot dynasty. His son, 
Alexander the Great or the Greek also came out of the Argit dynasty. So let's read on. With the reformed army containing phalanxes, that's a military type of formation that they were fighting. Right? They would have these long, um, I'm trying to, it's, it's not a spear. I can't think of the exact name. I think, I think it's phalanx or a pike, right? But they would have these long pikes or these long uh, spears, and they would use those in war. Wielding the Sarasa pike, Philip II defeated the old powers of Athens and Thebes and the Battle of Chaeronea in 338 BC. Philip II's son, Alexander the Great, leading a federation of Greek states, accomplished his father's objective of commanding the whole Greece when he destroyed Thebes after the city revolted. During Alexander's subsequent campaign of conquest, he overthrew the Achaemenid Empire and conquered territory that stretched as far as the Indus River. For a brief period, his Macedonian Empire was the most powerful in the world. See that? So we're reading about the Persian Empire. We put that map up. They were defeated by Alexander the Great. Or the Greek. Or the Freak. Or the Crete. Now, you can read about this in the book of 1 Maccabees. Let's go to 1 Maccabees. Remember the scriptures, again, they cover everything. They cover Philip. A Macedon. And we can go all day talking about history, man, and going into the biblical history and the scriptures and the prophecies and life in the ancient world. Right? First Maccabees chapter one and one. And it happened. After that, Alexander, the son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Kittim, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in instead, the first over Greece. See that? So he defeated Darius, the king of the Persians and Medes. This battle, which we commonly go into, is known as the Battle of Guaguamela. Some scholars call it the Battle of Arbella. We've been covering a lot of battle, battles. The Battle of um, Thimbro, Thimbra, the Battle of the Siege of Sardis. Right? There's been a lot of battles. The Battle of Apis. Here's another battle. The Battle of Guaguamela. If I can spell this right. Okay. Okay. The Battle of Guaguamela. This is how the Greeks took over the Persians. If you want to know how the Persians fell, that great army it wasn't by the Spartans. The Spartans didn't overthrow. The Greeks, when you watch that movie 300, it's just a, um, a movie about the bravery of those Spartans. It's not about how the Persians were defeated because King Leonidas couldn't defeat the Persians. Alexander the Freak had to come into power years later and defeat the Persians. So the Persians, yes, they invaded at the Battle of Marathon and they were defeated at the Battle of Marathon and they fought at Thermopylae. But they were ultimately defeated by the so-called white man at the Battle of Guaguamela. All right. So the Battle of Guaguamela, also called the Battle of Arbella, took place in 331 BC between the forces of the army of Macedon under Alexander the Great and the Persian army under King Darius the Third. It was the second and final battle between the two kings, and is considered to be the final blow to the Achaemenid Empire, resulting in its complete conquest by Alexander. You see that? The fighting took place in Guaguamela, which literally meant the camel's house, right? So this was a big deal right here, man. And you could, again, look up this battle, watch the documentaries. They have images on it on how the battle took place. And, you know, you can get deep into it. See this? They actually have a um, a sketch of how the battle took place. Because remember, a lot of these kings they took 
scribes with them and men that wrote chronicles. So they would write down how many people died, how the battle took place. And Alexander would explain what happened. They would write these things out. So here's Darius' army. Here's how the battle took place. All right, you can watch this on Kings and Generals or other YouTube channels to show the exact details of how this battle went down. But long story short, Darius got put to flight. That's Alexander taking over the Greeks. That's what Daniel, it's like I closed out. That's what Daniel 8 is talking about. It's about the Persians coming into power, defeating the Medes, and then the Greeks coming into power and defeating the Persians. Daniel 8 and 5 again. And as I was considering, behold, and he go came from the west of the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. So the Persians and the Medes started, lock, or the Persians and the Greeks started locking horns, for lack of better terms, and beginning to fight. And I saw him come close unto the ram. And he was moved with choler against him and smote the ram. So the Greeks took down the Persians and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver him, deliver the ram out of his hand. You see that? So Alexander the Great defeated the uh, defeated the um the Persians. And that's ancient history. Right? That's ancient history. And these are the things that we need to go over because our forefathers lived during these times. Man. And more importantly, it's in the Bible. The Bible covers these different kingdoms and their relationship towards Israel. And how the Mosai transitioned these different kingdoms one after the other. And this goes to all our different captivities. Man. Because when the Babylonians were defeated, we were transferred to the Persians. When the Persians were defeated, we were transferred to the Greeks. When the Greeks were defeated, we were transferred to the Romans. You know, just like now in Babylon and Greek, this is just another kingdom that we're in captivity in, shortly to be over through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashem Yahusha. But with that, I'm going to have to close up, giving, of course, all honor and all glory to Yahweh Bashem Yahusha. Uh, Mosai, willing you were edified. We're going to try to continue next week, Lord willing going into biblical history and early morning prophecy and the ancient world, picking up where we left off, covering more of the Greeks, transitioning into the Romans, and seeing how much we can get into covering the life of the ancient times. With that, tune into the Sabbath service. Should be around 12 o'clock p.m., Lord willing. Mighty lesson coming in through the spirit of power of Yahweh Again, keep the Sabbath holy. No buying, no selling, no sex on the Sabbath, no speaking your own words doing your own pleasure, and walking after the ways of your own heart. With that, Kwame Yashat. Shalom.